Okay, uh, welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, so you already got a, a kind of an overview of the project and also many of uh, the common themes, uh, uh, you know, across the different kinds of music that we're going to be looking at in this project. Uh, so, of course, uh, since, uh, as uh, Zavia said, we've only just started working uh, uh, on the project, uh, you, uh, you know, we really don't have anything very, very specific for any uh, particular style of music just yet. But what I'm trying to do, going, uh, uh, you know, going to give you an overview of, or at least try to do so, uh, is to tell you what we can do with our computational tools, with our, com our computing tools, and why uh, it may be useful. Uh, the last uh, two or three days uh, that I was here at FRSM, I saw there were a number of attempts, uh, you know, by uh, students, uh, you know, who worked uh, on taking uh, spectra of sounds and uh, trying to find uh, musically relevant information and so on. So there's a high degree of interest in that. Uh, but of course, uh, there is a, a methodology uh, to be followed in uh, doing that. And I thought, as you know, ha having we just start off with giving a very, very brief overview uh, of the kind of work. Uh, and uh, of course, we are very interested in uh, being able to apply uh, whatever we find or whatever tools we develop. And uh, the application areas roughly fall in these categories. We could use uh, our signal processing and computational tools uh, to enhance musicological studies. Uh, and I'll explain how uh, for teaching uh, for pedagogical purposes. And of course, uh, to enhance access and the enjoyment of music. Uh, uh, we are already showing the browser, and that's exactly the path to uh, go to enhance access. And uh, visualization, like the question you asked, you know, can we watch the parameters, uh, the moving versus how music is playing? So those are the kind of things uh, that we hope to be able to enable uh, you know, with the kind of uh, tools that we are developing. Okay, so very, very briefly, some of you must have been there at uh, you know, Dr. Puri Singh's talk and some of the other talk where she talked very nicely about uh, the attributes of sound and how they are related to physical properties. Uh, you know, very quickly, because I came across all these students trying to do all this signal processing. Uh, musical sounds are always periodic. Uh, the period itself is a very important attribute. Uh, it's known as the pitch of the sound. Uh, if you look at the waveform, you can see the periodicity. If you look at the spectrum, then you can see the discrete harmonics that comprise sound. The spacing between the harmonics corresponds to the pitch of the sound. Uh, the overall energy in the spectrum corresponds to the loudness of the sound. And the spectral envelope, the shape or the red <laughs> Uh, you know, shows us almost everything that we can learn and uh, you know perceive about them. Okay, so this is just a summary of what I said: uh, the intensity and the fundamental frequency and spectral temporal properties all together to completely define a sound. Now, what is musically important about the sound, or what they are really looking for in terms of what we call communicating with music, or the information uh, you know conveyed in music, uh, lies in one or uh, other or combinations of these. The basic dimensions of music are uh, melody, rhythm, and uh, tempo, and uh, you know, that's something that we just uh, went through. Uh, the melody is based on the pitch content, the rhythm, and the timing formation. The tempo is basically uh, you know, something related to the instrumentation or the texture of the sound. And uh, the other tools we use, uh, the signal processing tools, essentially allow you to access these high level musical attributes via low level attributes of pitch uh, and uh, intensity and spectrum. Okay, so what do we mean when we talk about extracting the pitch? Uh, so essentially, we're trying to get one of those attributes uh, that define the sound and, uh, you know, tie and, uh, you know, discard the others because uh, for some reason uh, an application we might consider uh, the pitch to be particularly uh, indicative of that, uh, you know, uh, property of the sound. So here is an example of a pitch contour and I'll just play the sound. to meditate rather than analyze. <laughs> okay, so now uh, what we mean by extracting the pitch contour is pretty much uh, getting this uh, contour out that has been shown. Uh, uh, of course, what you heard was full voice. Uh, but if I was to isolate attribute of pitch, then I might resynthesize something like this. Oh. 
Okay, so you get the idea. That's uh, the pitch, uh, the contour, and uh, basically from this, what we have managed to achieve is to separate the attribute of the voice, the timbre. Uh, so we now, at this point, uh, you know, do things like comparing pitch contours or concentrate specifically on the uh, the sensation elicited by just the pitch contours, uh, while uh, disregarding uh, you know, the other dynamics uh, and the number and so on. Uh, and of course, the visual comparison of pitch contours, uh, like you see here, of, uh, also can give you a lot of valuable information. Uh, the question of what this really tells you, uh, like uh, Professor Sarah already mentioned, uh, already normally considered to uh, you be made up of uh, discrete notes, uh, but it's not very clear whether there are any discrete notes uh, in the kind of music that I just played. For instance, when I try to uh, you know collect the steady state motions and mark them out on a grid, uh, you know, of the supposed notes, and uh, you know, get something like this. But you can see there are other kinds of music, uh, other uh, styles of singing, uh, which have a lot of mark, for instance, a lot of ornamentation uh, in Indian music, which uh, really are almost possible to uh, view as uh, you know, sequences of discrete notes. And there's an example of uh, this kind of uh, singing over here, the pitch control corresponding to uh, singing, which has a lot of heavy mark. Okay, so what are applications of this melodic contour? Uh, could, of course, uh, uh, usage for musical, music, musicological studies, such as intonation. Uh, that's also something that uh, Professor Sagasara just touched upon. Uh, melodic uh, phrase matching, what he talked about, the motive identification. We could also try to consider phrase matching for pedagogy. For instance, if uh, an early student is you know, trying to emulate uh, their uh, teacher or uh, might uh, uh, you know, get something out of the visual comparison of which contours. Uh, for improvisation, to understand how much elaboration is present in a particular which uh, contour, uh, your melodic phrase can be considered as the very minimal skeletal defining phrase and anything over and above that, uh, you know, would be left uh, to the imagination and improvisation uh, you know, of the musician. All of that could really be visualized uh, via this uh, particular representation. Uh, so this is, of course, we could use it in retrieval for any other similar contours. Uh, and finally, of course, we might be interested in getting symbolic notation for some other kinds of studies, which would rather work on symbolic notation rather than on audio. So the melodic contour gives, provides the bridge between the audio and uh, the final symbolic notation. Okay, uh, so uh, intonation uh, is very important if you talk about Indian music. Is, oh, you can sing if you have perfect shruti. Uh, there's not that much importance to other attribute of sound as there is uh, to uh, the shruti or the pitch. Uh, and of course, uh, it's also said the intonation uh, should be only of a certain uh, type or your notes should be toned only in a certain manner, which go with a particular raga, the particular gana, and so on. So, what does this really mean? If you listen to illustrations of differently intoned notes, musicians uh, very closely you often find it's not only just about a steady pitch. Uh, very often the note that is being toned has a different contour, it might even have a different timbre, the voice quality might change. So all of these things can really be investigated much more uh, you know, scientifically and thoroughly uh, via uh, kind of tools uh, that we use. Uh, pitch pass distributions are one uh, very uh, you know, simple way of uh, viewing intonation and already saw examples of this, so I won't talk about that. Okay, as we saw the pitch contour had a lot of augmentation, uh, you know, it's, it was far from a steady. Uh, so the augmentations basically are, uh, they are, uh, have kind of, kind of been uh, studied and uh, roughly categorized, not entirely. Uh, Sangeet Research Academy has, of course, a very uh, nice site which gives a lot of uh, information that's been gleaned, uh, you know, from sources of knowledge as well as from the audio itself, and uh, with examples of various kinds of orientations. Okay, so I'll just give some quick examples of the kind of work uh, that is uh, that we've been doing uh, about visualization and pedagogy. Uh, so here's a piece on two extracted uh, from a song. Uh, so I'll play that to you, and I'll uh, try to hopefully see the point I'm trying to make. Okay, so now this is sung by, uh, this is an original audio, uh, I know it's a pitch track of the original audio, it's being superposed on this program. Uh, this is, uh, you know, emulated by a singer. And this is yet another singer. So do you hear the difference? So what were the prominent differences between the two singers? Hmm? Yeah, so you can see uh, if you listen closely that all of this mark is really missing. Okay, so you see it when the pitch on tour. Uh, so this is actually uh, the, this representation of the it does indeed capture what you hear. So it's amply evident uh, that there are differences. As a matter of fact, the third singer or second singer is completely no accurate. Okay, there's nothing wrong with the uh, the, the sur or the basic notes uh, that are being hit. It's all the 
connections and what is between the nodes uh, that is really different. So the work is not realized. So this actually uh, is something that I can do. And as a matter of fact, you can go further and try to parameterize the shapes. For instance, a particular gamma, uh, you know, where the difference is ice, can be viewed as uh, so a gliding oscillation or oscillation upon a glide and uh, you could parameterize this in terms of the shape of the glide itself as well as the rate of the oscillations. And uh, if you kind of uh, try to do parameter modeling of this, it turns out that it is possible to differentiate these uh, and actually correlate these with uh, your expert judgments. Uh, for instance, if you are an expert uh, to label these as uh, you know very good and not so good, uh, it correlates very well with these measurable parameters uh, that one could expect from this big one. Okay, rhythm presentation, uh, as I already talked about, it's possible to do and the signal processing involves is all about detecting uh, onsets uh, and especially with work instruments, that's relatively, instrument is relatively easy to do. It's not so easy to do for the voice, but of course the melody already captures some of the rhythm and so on, so uh, those things are done. Okay, the transcription problem is the last thing I'm going to deal with. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting problem uh, because it's so well defined. We already saw Turkish music, uh, you know, showed us some nice symbolic uh, notation, but also we saw that there were differences uh, from the pitch code. Uh, so, uh, transcription is something we might try to do by, uh, in terms of finding discrete notes and, uh, you know, trying to label them. Uh, but it's very hard to, as you can see from uh, an example. Okay, so here is song, I don't have the audio with this, uh, but uh, you can see that the light ray lies the pitch contour. And, uh, uh, what we have here, the dark lines are an attempt to do a transcription and you can see it's a pretty challenging job because there does not seem, seem to be any clear rule on where to place the flat lines. But should we be able to do it successfully, then what would turn this continuous pitch contour into a sequence of notes uh, with a pitch and uh, duration. Uh, so I am hoping of course uh, that you know, some of uh, our other uh, speakers, very eminent musicians will have uh, something to say about this. Uh, but this would take us a step towards doing all other kinds of mining of music, uh, you know, once we have a kind of symbolic notation. Uh, well, to summarize, uh, as I said, there hasn't been too very much uh, work uh, in the area, but there are some very prominent examples of, uh, you know, some groups that have been working for uh, long. One that comes to mind is Professor Datta and his group at ITC SRA, uh, you know, Dr. Ranjan Singh Gupta and Ityanand Dev, who have been steadily working for many years and have produced quite a bit of scientific, uh, you know, uh, studies and uh, very scholarly work on, uh, you know, intonation uh, and many, many other aspects. And I think currently uh, they're also working on linking uh, raga with emotion and so on. So uh, we have had some but very little work and I think there's a lot of building upon that that can be done. And the thing is that what we are looking at are very, very down to a practical issues. We are not really entering a philosophical realm or, you know, looking at statements which may be interpreted. We, want, we are looking at concrete uh, instances of studies that we can maybe bolster by doing audio analysis to see whether they indeed hold or not or whether there is anything more to add. Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much. And, uh,